And really it's not just about quantity of life, but quality of life. There are 76,000 people living with Alzheimer's in the state of Oregon. There is going to be a lot of older folks in the future. Uh, 70 million plus by 2030. I am a Monmouth uh, gal. I graduated from Western Oregon in 1993, and I um, graduated from doc with Dr. Henkels in policy administration, and a minor in sociology with special em emphasis on being a mature or an aging society. And um, one of the questions I was asked, kind of addressed, was my career path, and I'll make it very brief because it is brief. Um, I um, had various experiences in my life, uh, dancing, singing, entertaining, that kind of thing. And I was fortunate um, while going to school to become activity director uh, or assistant to an activity director. And um, that was the day I realized that I loved working with this population. However, when I went to school, I felt like I was going to be a nursing home administrator. And I did my um, practicum at Dallas care center in Dallas and had a wonderful experience, but came out of there with the hope of doing something a little bit different, um, maybe addressing um, aging in a proactive approach as opposed to a reactive, which is kind of what your center has um, been in the past, what a place of socialization and opportunity for people to come together um, for socialization, but usually by the time they come to the center, they had... Um, had some social struggles. And um, looking at you know, career path, I wanted to see what can I do to help people stay in their homes as long as possible. And ultimately, could we avoid people leaving their homes but being able to age in place? And I know Julie has a lot to say on that subject. Um, I was um, located to the Dalles right after I graduated from college and had an opportunity to work in a nonprofit senior center. And ultimately, I had no um, Experience that would make me an executive director, except for I was in the right place at the right time. <laughs> it's a service. <laughs> <laughs> right place at the right time in a small community and a board of directors that understood that I was passionate about working with older adults and I was willing to learn. And so I had an opportunity to try something with very low pay right out, I'll tell you very low pay, but I worked for five years as a training site, and it was a wonderful experience, meal program, um, travel, transportation program, activities and services for older adults, um, fundraising, I mean, just a wonderful learning because it's the, allowed me to work in every little area that could lead me to a different career. In uh, 1997, um, I moved back to, this, to Salem and was being given a, a greater opportunity than that was to be executive director of Center 50 Plus. Center 50 Plus is a facility, a 30,000 square foot facility that offers more than 200 different programs and services. Um, and um, again, uh, I was in my early 20s and um, maybe my experience level wasn't what it uh, needed to be, but I was, they were, um, in a kind of a risky position, they're getting ready to close their center, and they get an opportunity to, um, to come in, and I had no job and um, minimal experience, but I had this great degree from Western Oregon, and again, um, lots of volunteer opportunities and experience that had brought me to that place. Uh, so what I would say to you in that is um, sometimes we don't always know what our, our career path is going to be. Um, we have an idea, we have passion, we have uh, things that sound interesting to us, but it's a culmination of all the different experiences in my life that kind of led me to where I am today. And it's ever-changing. It is probably one of the most rewarding careers um, I could encourage anyone to go into because it's ever-changing. Uh, people are ever-changing. and. Um, What's exciting about Center 50 Plus, for me personally, is we are changing every day because the crowd that comes in is changing and they are dictating where we need to go and what we need to do to better serve that population. 
The other is, this is the group that we're working with. They are our leaders. They are our business owners. They are our politicians. They are our mentors. Uh, they're people that have created some of the biggest changes in our society or will continue to make changes. And it's exciting to support their health, their, um, their growth, their opportunities um, through our programs and services so that the betterment of our whole community will be seen um, as we support this important area of our, of our society. Have I used my eight minutes? You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to flag us? I could, but go, you know, if you, if you have a few more things you want to add, you're fine. <clears throat> well, some of the programs and services that we're starting to um, move into come out of the name change. Uh, we, you know, in the, the late 60s when the Older Americans Act um, was passed, there was this whole focus on nutrition. And we, we still believe nutrition is, is key, healthy diet and, and that kind of um, health is instrumental. But um, they added, started adding in socialization, and that's why senior centers started really popping up in conjunction with the meal program is that um, socialization was important, providing a place for people to come together where they could be a part of us and have a sense of community with their peers. That hasn't changed. Um, we still believe socialization is important. But we also know that health and fitness and health and care for ourselves is extremely important. Um, we, when you think about uh, why we are there, we, we believe that we're there because of, um, it's, we kind of see ourselves as um, upstream health care. You know that um, as a society, we are seeing things happening in aging and health and um, all of those different things that are a part of that health makeup. People can't find doctors. Um, they're struggling to get good health care. There's these kind of things. What can we do to respond to that? Well, it's helping people remain healthy as long as they can through um, good diet, through exercise, through health and wellness, through remaining engaged, connected, and taking ownership over their own aging process. So what we do is we're just simply providing people the tools. We really don't do anything for one person. We are not uh, what people would see as maybe welfare or something like that. We provide people valuable tools so that they can take a sense, um, take the responsibility of their aging process, make choices, make decisions, make changes so that they have a better handle on their own aging process. So they're not victims to aging, but rather in control of their destiny. And that's kind of the philosophy at the center is live life to the fullest, do that you, all that you can, be all that you can be, and know that um, when on that last day of life, that you won't sit there and say, I shoulda, I coulda, or I woulda, but I did. And really, it's not just about quantity of life, but quality of life. So through good aging, um, good techniques of care and health and lifelong learning, people are going to take advantage of that so that quality of life and achieving goals and fulfilling all those dreams and purpose is really what they're going to leave as their, uh, their legacy. And that's what we want to help people do through our programs and services, is create that legacy, be in control of the aging process as much as they possibly can, and carry on through purpose, passion, and connectivity to their community. Thank you. Mark, you want to make? Well, purpose, I can't use the Purpose, passion, and a connection to communities, but Maryland does definitely. And I got to say, I'm probably the odd person out because I don't really work in the field as directly, and um, these people are the real experts. But I can tell you what I do know. And uh, one thing is there is going to be a lot of older folks in the future, uh, 70 million plus by 2030. A lot of you know these statistics, I know. And over 9 million people over 85 by 2030. And that's a lot of people who are going to need various kinds of help. Um, a typical way when people think about jobs in the future, a lot of times, what I, what I like that Marilyn emphasized is that um, it's not all caregiving, which is very important, obviously, but when you think about it as an area where you might go into employment, caregiving is a big, big component, and health-related issues are big, big components, community-based services are big, big components, but there's a lot more to it. But since so many people do focus on caregiving, I do want to just say a couple things about it just in a general kind of 
academic sense, um, millions of people are going to be caregivers. Uh, millions already are, actually. 1.8 million already are right now. But there are different levels and different expertise people bring to it. And I, I imagine there's probably people here right now that are caregivers at the most fundamental level of basic health services or basic uh, in-home services. But hmm, how do I put this nicely? That's not where the money's at. <laughs> and, and, and what I mean by that is, you, you know, these people are essential. They're critical. They have to be very good. But most people who go to college are thinking different than that. But it is a major kind of experience to have to understand what it takes to have that happen. If you, you know, when besides your basic caregiving, then you sort of have the medicalized caregiving. And um, if you're at Western right now, you may not be thinking of it for your first degree, but it is something to watch for in the future, such as being a nurse practitioner or a nutritionist or something like that, which requires it. In which case, your salary might go from maybe 21,000 as your basic caregiver to about 43 if you're a more specialized technical caregiver. But I would imagine people in here are thinking more in terms of maybe at least at some point later in life becoming more of a manager kind of position of some sort. And in which case, uh, according to MetLife, who keeps track of all these things, you're looking more like at 78,000. Now, I'm not about money. I wouldn't be here. But it is about <laughs> understanding what you're talking about when you uh, get into the business. And I think it, it's, a, it, it's an area of society where it's much better to be motivated for, I think, good social reasons. But you need to make a living, and you need to think about how to advance your career. And that's sort of what I'm mostly interested in talking about here today. Um, besides, um, when you look at health care itself, it's not all just uh, delivering uh, actual on-site care. Um, these days, there is a lot of efforts to try to find ways to keep people in their homes or try, in the case like Marilyn talks about, is keeping people from even reaching the point where they need care. And so you find that you have coaches, well, at least according to MetLife, you can put them into categories of coaches, is the term they like to use. And you can have like a chronic illness coach and a medication coach. Then you can have what they call navigators, people who help others find their way through the system. So patient navigators help patients understand the medical system and give them advice, a place to turn to. If any of you have had grandparents or great-grandparents perhaps or parents that have encountered the medical system and when one spouse is, is disabled, the other spouse might be trying to track things, but they need people to turn to. And this is a very important type of field that's out there that I think a lot of times gets overlooked. So you don't have to be the care provider to be a great assistance to those people. Um, and, uh, and when you think about that, I think what I, I, I think is a useful thing to keep in mind is um, some of it will be done for lower income people. That's really what you're going to address, and I think that's really important. But there's a lot of people out there, the retiring baby boomers are a mixed lot, and many of them are reasonably affluent and uh, even people older than that who are still healthy, like my parents. And, but when they need help, they're going to actually be paying it out of pocket or through a long-term private insurance system. So when you are thinking about this as a field, and you are thinking about these kinds of jobs, it's useful to not just think state agencies or, or, or community-based uh, uh, agencies. It's also, I think, in the long run, when you think down the road, it might very well be that you're going to be an entrepreneur. You might have your own business, and, and in fact, there's going to be a great need for people that set themselves up to help people before, well, people who are too wealthy to have the needs and get it covered by Medicaid or even Medicare, depending on where that goes in the future. Um, but I was asked to talk about advocacy, and, uh, and, and um, maybe it was because I was a pre-law advisor. I don't know. But... And advocacy means so many things in this field. I think it's, it's, an amazing, it's a huge term. But I think you can kind of divide it into sort of political and legal advocacy, which is more me be, being a political scientist by training I'm pretty comfortable with. And there is already 4,400 members of the um, National Academy of Elder Law that are specialists in elder law. That's their specialty. And that's going to be a continual growing field. 
and they have to deal with all kinds of issues. But among the things they deal with are uh, ensuring you get benefits, establishing trusts, uh, developing and adjusting advanced directives, working on age discrimination. There's a huge field out there for people that are interested in the legal kind of advocacy. But that's a relatively small percentage of people that get involved in it. I think a lot of times when people think advocacy, they think of political advocacy. Mm -hmm. And I would kind of say that it's like when my students come in and they tell me they want to go into politics and they want to stay in Oregon, I kind of say, and you want to have a living? Because <laughs> it's, it is a tough, there's not a lot of jobs that will pay you a lot to go and advocate for seniors at the Capitol. There are some. And I'm, I'm all for you guys if you're going for it. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk about how to do that. But, there, but there's not a lot of them out there, okay? Um, you might have heard about the AARP, a big, obviously a giant organization, okay? 1.3 million billion people, or 1.3 billion dollars uh, involved in it. Employs over 2,100 people. But the large majority of that is actually in their insurance system. But they do have lobbyists, and you can do it. And, you, and if you're willing to travel, go to Washington or go to larger states. There is roles there for people who advocate uh, if you're interested in advocating for the local care system, O4AD, for example, um, Nicole Armstrong's a great person to contact, and she will take interns. And actually, at Naomi's, you're really an advocate. I mean, you can speak to this better than I could. So there's lots of smaller, important groups that are specialized that do advocacy for their, their element of the problem or element of the possibilities. There's probably an advocate for community centers, I would imagine, somewhere in the capital. But, but nonetheless, it's not one that you directly target, I think, so easily. Um, and that kind of leads to where I really want to go uh, as far as what I think is the way to go about in working in this field. As Dr. Manugian said, experience is probably the number one thing. That's the best uh, tool you can have best thing to help you get jobs later. I was really glad to hear gerontology is putting it more in their program. Uh, it's really essential. Uh, when you, and I would say that when you think about experience, there's kind of two types of experience that I found seems to work best for students. One is any experience in the field. <laughs> Just getting an idea of what the population and what the issues and, and what kinds of organizations and tasks are out there. But the second one is as you build your careers is don't think short term in a career. I would say that people that are being most successful in this field are people who tend to have under, learned many different things in different kind of spots. In a way, Marilyn kind of demonstrated where she was in a small organization but did lots of tasks. Or when you are getting into a, a when, you, when you do start working in the field is always be aware of what skills you need to develop or what experiences you need to develop what programs you'd like to interact with because it possibly will open a new channel, new direction to go. So as an undergrad, you'll do relatively limited internships, and, but they're important. But I would say when you start your career, think about your next 10 years as your postgraduate education. And think consciously uh, about what kind of things you want to have on your resume when you start moving into the more managerial levels. Um, I think all too often people kind of wind up in a spot, and it's a great spot, and they're comfortable there, and life goes on, but if you really do want to get to where you're having more influence and getting the rewards of being more responsible, then you, you need to think systematically, and you need to continue learning. It's really like that. The other thing um, I would say, and, and, and this ties directly into it, is expertise. If after you've worked a few years in the field, or even as undergraduates, uh, you, sometimes you can re pretty readily identify which expertise you might want to have to bring with you when you go out there, uh, whether it's in nutrition, or it's in exercise physiology, or something like that, or it's in medical kind of care, or if it's in bookkeeping, very important, or law, or, or just simply knowing how to navigate the system. It takes an active engagement to learn that expertise, but if you can identify those things and kind of build up your, your uh, what do they call it, portfolio, then, then you're going to be much better off. So I, I would think in this field especially, because we simply don't know where it's going to go with government programs. We simply don't know how we're going to take care of all these people. 
but there's needs are going to be there and the people who are able to uh, bring many different possibilities uh, to the table when it's time to shift jobs or move upward I think they're going to do a lot better and I just want to conclude by saying that um, really when you look out there uh, is think of it I'm off for work and doing it because it's a good thing to do but I also think you want to be businesslike about it my sister is uh, works at a large uh, care facility up in Seattle and it it's the full spectrum kind of facility and she got a business degree as an undergraduate and MSW as a graduate student years later and that business degree has served her more than her gerontology degree now that's not to knock a gerontology degree at all but what I'm saying is it's a field that requires lots of different types of expertise and that's the constant thing I think you want to keep in mind is keep working and developing a level where you're of competency in many different possible fields anyway that's what I'd have to say thank you Mark Julie, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Hi, I'm Julie Mendez. Not sure. I know, I might have to move it a little bit more. Hi, I'm Julie, and um, I've worked with Northwest Senior and Disability Services for about 14 years. And I've stayed there because I really enjoy what I do. Otherwise, I would um, have probably changed professions a long time ago. Um, I graduated in um, 1997 with my bachelor's from um, OSU and had no idea that I would end up working with um, seniors and people with disabilities. I actually thought that I would be working with, um, I really wanted to be a child protective service worker and that was my goal. And um, then I went and volunteered after um, school was out. I was working at a, the job I could get um, outside of the social service world and um, was able to flex my hours so I could go volunteer at Child Protective Services and I went and actually did the work and I knew it wasn't for me. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't leave it at the end of the day and so that's when I realized I, I have to kind of re, um, rethink about what I want to do. Um, I thank goodness found uh, a program that was a little bit, it was more of a prevention program. It was called Healthy Start. And so I went and volunteered for them because I kind of wanted to find out if maybe prevention is more the area that I, I would do better at. And, and I really enjoyed it. I um, was there for a few months and a job with Polk County came open where I was doing information and assistance. That's the job that I would be you know, applying for. So I did that, and that's really how I got into a paid social service type job. I always knew that's what I wanted to do. I knew that it was some area of social service. I just wasn't obviously sure which one. And so as, um, as I did the work with Polk County, I started developing more information about all the different resources out there. Um, for, and it was primarily for younger families, but I also became more familiar with senior services and disability services, and um, heard about Northwest Senior and Disability Services, and had always had really nice feedback about them, and, and liked their um, goal of customer service. They just kind of seemed to be a little bit different than other government agencies, and so then I started applying with them, and was fortunate enough to be able to become an eligibility worker which basically means it's kind of the start, one of the starting positions with the agency, and you're doing financial determination for programs like uh, Medicaid, and we call it Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program now, but it, was, it used to be called um, food stamps in the past. So that was a really good way to start my career with Northwest Senior Disability Services because those are the programs that um, are probably some of our most difficult programs, and I got to know them pretty well as an eligibility worker. But uh, that just, I knew for long term that wasn't necessarily my cup of tea. I'm not really a numbers person, so when you're you know, dealing with numbers all day and that's not really where your heart is, kind of figure it's probably time to look for something else. And, and thank goodness within the agency, an information and assistance position came available. And Northwest Senior Disability Services, we've, we've always had a real strong commitment to educating the public about what's available for seniors. And then a few years ago, we also um, integrated um, people with disabilities into our agency, the coverage that we provide. And, and so I was able to become a worker with the Information Assistance Unit. And kind of like Dr. Henkel was saying, um, it, was, it was wonderful because then I was able to really get a broad perspective of all the different programs that we offered as well as what the community provided and what other resources like Center 50 Plus and the Alzheimer's Network and, and I think it really helped and then so when I decided I wanted to, to try something different and work more directly with um, 
with seniors and people with disabilities long term, then um, a case management position with the Medicaid program came up. And so I, I did that for about 10 years and, and really enjoyed that opportunity because I got to um, meet with people who financially couldn't afford care on their own but needed, still needed it. So helping them know how to hire for in-home care options and also care facility options, helping them get connected to those that have Medicaid vacancies and kind of helping them navigate that program. And then, um, you know, I always, I really enjoyed that work, but I think it's important that you try new opportunities. And so after about 10 years, it was kind of time to do something a little different. And our agency um, had received a grant from um, the State Unit on Aging to be, um, a, to be a, I guess, one of the, the few um, agencies around the state that offered options counseling. And options counseling is for people um, they actually have private pay resources who are looking for care, but just don't know where to start. And so kind of like you were talking about the baby boomers, we're starting to get a lot of, um, a lot of people coming in wanting to do some pre-planning about you know, what types of care options are there, how much approximately do they cost, um, what is long-term care insurance, uh, what things to take into consideration with it. So it's been really nice because I've been able to do options counseling for the last couple of years and kind of blend all the different jobs I've had in the past um, into this one job. And, and I, I've just been so fortunate to, to continue to be able to grow in, in the profession. And not sure exactly what's going to happen down the road, but, but for now I think it's a, it's a really good opportunity. And, and there will be other opportunities like that in the future. We need to have more people who are knowledgeable about how how things work as far as hiring in-home care, all the in-home care resources, how it works with the Medicaid program, how Medicare works, kind of helping people understand all those systems and how they work together. So um, that's kind of how I've ended up being an options counselor. I did want to just kind of mention a little bit about our agency too because I think it's important if you are going into the field of gerontology to at least if you're going to be working in the five counties that we serve, which are Marion, Polk, Yam, Hill, Clatsop and Tillamook, that you at least have a knowledge that we are here. We have a wonderful group of um, uh, information assistance workers that take calls Monday through Friday about all kinds of topics related to seniors and people with disabilities. And so if you're working with a client down the road in whatever capacity it might be, just want people to know that we're there. We don't, it doesn't cost anything to work with our programs. Uh, there are workers like me that I can always talk to people, or we have information assistance workers that talk to people um, on the phone and answer more general questions. So, try to think. And then I kind of wanted to just mention too the different programs that we offer besides financial assistance, because a lot of people associate financial assistance with our agency. But we also offer um, we have a family caregiver support program that helps um, unpaid caregivers get access to respite care and counseling as well as um, support groups and trainings that are happening in the community. We also have a senior peer counseling program which has a train that trains volunteers to go out and meet with individuals who are going through the different life transitions. We have um, a SHIBA program, which is Senior Health Insurance Benefits Assistance, which we have trained volunteers that will meet with um, individuals trying to figure out Medicare and if they're in the right Medicare supplement or Medicare Part D plan that works best for them. So, so again, just all these different services we offer, I, I think it's just really important for, for anyone who's working in the field to kind of know that we're there and that we're more than happy to talk to people about about what their needs are. And so I have, we have a table back there and I brought some of these agency brochures just for people to have and you can you know, take one if you think it would be helpful. Um, we, we also at different times look for volunteers for our programs and um, we've had practicum students and if someone's interested, they can always call our human resources department and talk to them further about what type of you know, opportunities we might have in that, in that way, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Naomi? Oh, I guess I better give you the microphone. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Don't touch the ground. <laughs> um, so my name's Naomi Tillery. I am with the Alzheimer's Network, and it's okay to, for you guys to smile. It's a good good day. I'm just honestly, I'm so excited to be here. I didn't tell me who was going to be on the panel, so to see Julie and Mary, I'm just. <laughs> 
so excited. <laughs> um, we too are at the Center 50 Plus, and I just want to say on behalf of Alzheimer's Network, we just enjoy that the Center 50 Plus has us there. They've um, done so much for us in supporting our organization. Um, the Alzheimer's Network is 10 years old this year. Um, we actually started because the Alzheimer's Association, uh, which is the national uh, group on, on Alzheimer's um, had a chapter in Salem. However, um, you know, the monies that they were raising at the time were going really up to Portland, and then from Portland it would go to wherever, other parts of Oregon, even other parts of the country. So they actually felt that it was no longer viable to have a chapter in Salem, and so they closed the doors. Um, the board members that were serving at that time um, were the, are the charter members of what started our organization because there was a need for our organization within um, Marion, Pokeland, and Benton County. So um, our focus is the individuals with the disease, their families, and their caregivers, providing them with resources, services, education, and sometimes just a shoulder to lean on. So that's kind of why we're here. Um, I kind of did not have some of the past that these guys have had. Mine's kind of odd. Um, I moved here three years ago now from Spokane, Washington, actually hailing from Hawaii, so Northwest living is still um, not something I'm used to. <laughs> um, but um, I, my background is actually in real estate and in mortgages and in financial consulting. So three years ago, I had my little girl and the economy took a dump and um, my company experienced layoffs. It was a bittersweet moment for me because no job, but I got to be a stay-at-home mom for a couple of years. So I really enjoyed that opportunity. Um, moved down here um, because uh, her dad wanted to go back to school. Oddly enough, it was here. Um, and uh, so he came back to school here, and um, I was just kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Did I want to get back into real estate? Did I want to get back into mortgages? Was that a healthy life for my daughter? Um, and it was kind of fortuitous. Um, the year my daughter was born, my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And I uh, didn't know anything at that time about Alzheimer's. And um, after moving here, um, found out about the Alzheimer's Network. In 2011, I was a volunteer, actually volunteered probably 40 hours a week, which is unusual. But I enjoyed it, and I had a passion for it. Um, I have a passion for the people who are going through it, and I definitely understand what they're going through. Uh, January of last year, I was offered a full-time position as the communications and fund development coordinator for our organization. And I can't tell you, um, I know fund development, asking for money doesn't sound very fun, but I enjoy it because I know when I'm asking people for money, I'm asking them to invest in an organization that really cares about the people and, um, you know, really they're caring about someone like my grandmother. They're caring about someone like my family and what they're going through. Um, we get to work with, with people like Marilyn. Um, you know, they have a program called Among Friends, the day respite program specifically for people with Alzheimer's, and that's so important. Um, I get to work with people like Julie, um, who, you know, is such a supporter. She comes to all of our education programs, which is so awesome. Um, the one great thing, too, is minus myself and my two colleagues, we're really, really motored by volunteers. Our board is made up of volunteers. Uh, we have volunteer speakers that come and speak for us, Dr. Winningham being one of them. Um, and uh, if it wasn't for the volunteers, we probably would have shut our doors a long time ago. We really would have. Um, so we really definitely depend on not just money, but the volunteers, the time, the heart that they put into it. Um, I think last summer it was um, that we had our first practicum student from here at Western. So it's, um, it's still new for us, but we're very excited. Um, we have two practicum students right now. One of them actually just finished her practicum. One is still going with us. And then Erin is actually a volunteer for us as well. So we have developed a relationship here at Western that would allow you to do practicums with us. Um, we have a program of volunteer coordinator there's tons of volunteers opportunities, whether you, you volunteer under programs or you volunteer for one of our events 
or you volunteer in our office or for our support groups. Um, you know, I think one of the great things is from, from my job, I think I'm the lucky one because I get to go out, I get to go to the memory care communities, I get to see the faces of those people living with Alzheimer's, and I get to see um, the families and knowing that we're supporting those families and providing them with what they need is probably more more rewarding. I didn't ever think when I got to this place I would be working for a, a nonprofit. You know, um, I definitely didn't think I was going to be in healthcare. Um, I still struggle with what Medicare and Medicaid is. To be honest, I still don't know. But um, I have a heart for this. Uh, I honestly, to be a part of this, this is so exciting for me because to encourage you guys to work with our senior population. They're a population that, as society, we want to take the key, lock them up, and throw it away. And it is, it's saddening to me. These are the people who paved the way for us, who went through far worse than we will probably ever go through in our lifetime. They went through the Great Depression. We're talking about an economy that's not doing really well. Talk to one of them. Talk to one of them about the Great Depression. Then you'll think, well, maybe this isn't that bad. But I, I love children. I, I have a four-year-old, and, and I definitely love children programs. But the seniors, I mean, I. I <laughs> Honestly, when I come to work every day, I think that's why I love working at the, the Center 50 Plus. I get to see those guys every day, the volunteers that you guys have. Um, um, Dolores, honestly, she gives me a smile every day. Nancy, all those guys down there. It's, I, I'm a lucky girl to get to do what I get to do, honestly. And um, I'm honored that I was asked to, to come and share what I do and what our organization is doing in the community. Um, you know, again, 10 years this year, it's a milestone for us. Um, I don't know if you guys realize this, there are 76,000 people living with Alzheimer's in the state of Oregon, and 10,000 of those are here in the Mid-Willamette Valley. That's a lot. And when you think about it, when you think about that, it's like taking the person with Alzheimer's, taking a rock and throwing it into a, a pond. That rock represents somebody with Alzheimer's, but then you start to see the ripples. Those ripples are the spouses, the children, the grandchildren, great-grandchildren in some cases, um, friends, fam uh, family, coworkers, the community. We're all affected by it. And there's a need for what we do. And to, again, to be a part of it, you know, there's 165,000 unpaid caregivers here in the state of Oregon, unpaid. We're talking about friends and family that are some of them having to leave their jobs, draw on their own 401ks to care for their, for their parents, for their loved ones. Um, and I think a number that I'm becoming more familiar with that's kind of um, sad is one in seven with Alzheimer's lives alone. That is a very scary number when you really think about it, one in seven. Um, and uh, numbers that just got released this year, one in three seniors will die of Alzheimer's. So. The Alzheimer's Association, I love what they do. They're looking at the future. They're looking for research, looking for the cure. But, and I think that's great, but we have to think about the people right now. We know the cure's not coming anytime soon, so what are we doing right now? And again, to be that person that helps them find places like what Julie offers. I, I see Willamette Valley Hospice in the back. Um, to be able to point people in those directions and let them know that they don't have to go through this alone is, is more rewarding than someone can pay me. So, thank you. So Center 50 Plus, what, what can volunteers do? Well, every program area, actually we have a really cool kind of makeup. Every program area has a volunteer component. So from the minute you walk in the front door, receptionist, et cetera, but every program area from lapidary to woodshop to lifelong learning to also the um, adult day respite program have volunteers working in there. And so when you look through the program guide, there's one on the back table, you can look and see, you know, I'm interested in and know that there's a volunteer job available in that area. We try to give people an opportunity to be in every area at the center. And, um, you know, when we do talk a lot about being program, you know, very program driven. Um, and you could look at a variety of program, varying levels of aging from our, our boomers that are in there primarily for caregiver support to um, people that are in there getting information for end of life decisions and choices. So 
you have that program kind of arena that you can look at, but you can also take advantage of technology. You know, we have very, very specific projects or, or needs, like a student to come in and help me understand social media mm -hmm. and this new generation coming in and our older generation and how can we connect. Um, so you have the technology area. Um, in addition to that, we have opportunities, you know, Dr. Hinkles was talking about needing to know business practices. At my job interview 15 years ago, they asked me, do you know how to operate a dishwasher? So I sat there and I was like, huh, how does that work? Knowing what they were trying to say to me is, do you know how to operate this facility without any assistance? And that's kind of what you get a chance to be as a frontline worker and an operational manager and look at all the different arenas so that you can see, you know, that full scope that, you know, yes, the aging and working with older adults is amazing and, and that's why I'm there, but there's other elements that go on behind the scenes that would be very rewarding, but also um, educational for people to take advantage of budgeting, uh, budget process, um, building maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of opportunities and you could bounce around from department to department for the entire term. Just question about shadowing uh -huh. you know, opportunities at um, here and maybe other places too. So I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, I just no, make sure everybody right. hears that. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. Matter of fact, I've told some of our practicum students one of the things that I do is I do a lot of networking. I do a lot of visits at the communities. I just and that's probably my favorite part is going to the communities. But the networking and yeah, I welcome the opportunity to have you shadow me for a day or two and really get to see what we do and who we come in contact with um, each and every day. It's it's. I think you'd have a good time, yeah. <laughs> uh, question about being a volunteer coordinator, what kind of courses would be most, uh, would be most beneficial? Um, I'll leave it open for you, Mark. A volunteer coordinator, um, do you mean like at a state agency or at a large facility where there's... We have one. Yeah, we have one, one, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, what would you look for? Not those questions for you. <laughs> I, I, no, I'll answer it too, but uh, I mean, better to get it right from someone who might have. You know, all, again, you have to, one of the th key things, too, for, for what we look for is someone has people skills. Yeah. You have to be willing to go out and, and, and talk to the people and, and really be excited about what you're representing, whether you're with the Center 50 Plus or, or with Northwest or with us, you know, be excited about what you do um, when you're wanting, because if you're wanting people to come, you're not excited and they ain't coming. You know, um, one of the one of the things I'll share is um, the volunteer coordinator we had. Um, I think Dr. Whittingham got to meet her, Amy. Um, she that's her thing. She loves volunteers. She actually did. Uh, um, she just went and took an undergrad um, program down in OSU, dealing with that. So there is there is a volunteer uh, study. I'm not sure what the correct term is but yeah I mean we're looking for people who and also management um, I don't know how you would like people management being able to manage a large large group of people it's you know you're looking a couple hundred people the ability to manage them and oversee them problem solve direction things like that those are little key things we're looking for I actually can add I'll, I'll use some of you in here know that I'm a former career center director in my previous life I was <laughs> Um, here at Western and other places and a um, lot of different majors go into volunteer coordination. A lot of it has to do with just what Dr. Henkels was emphasizing and that is experience, experience, experience. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in volunteer coordination, obviously being a volunteer, shadowing someone, being with someone, helping volunteer coordinators do that work, regardless of if you're a poli-sci major or a gerontology major or a business major, that's where you're going to get those experiences and the references. These people will act as references for you to be able to further your career path. So. I would also say communications. If you're thinking coursework, mm -hmm. and an example of an excellent communications course to take is they do one on fundraising by Dr. Mayhead, and they actually plan, and last year they benefited actually the Mama Senior Center, but they actually put together, it's called an event, organization I believe it's easy to identify and they actually organize a fundraiser for a nonprofit and frankly if you're going into this business 
knowing how to raise funds is very important. Now, this is event-based, but it just gives you these skills to work with lots of people. It'd be a nice line in your resume, may I add, to have done that. But it's a really excellent core course, and I think communications is very good for that. But you're not going to beat experience, um, uh, really. Just, and, and that's one of the things I would just emphasize is even you know, times have been pretty hard recently, and I know people that graduated last year and they're not working, or at least didn't get jobs right away, okay? Very disappointing. I can tell you the ones that were volunteering and doing stuff, they're the ones that are getting the positions first. So when you, if you graduate and things aren't happening, keep yourself busy by just thinking, you know, when they say, what are you doing with yourself, you want to have an answer. And if your answer is like, I'm working as a volunteer and I'm helping them arrange volunteers, that's going to really be a better thing to have, be able to say than to say, well, I've been looking for a job. Yeah. I'm going to uh, do a little segue here because I want to introduce our member, our last panelist that just arrived. That's Leslie Francis. And she's an, I actually met Leslie last week. Yes. She's an administrator of the Dallas Retirement Village Assisted Living, and she's a geriatric nurse. And so I thought maybe we'd give her her time, and then we'll break, and you can talk to people individually. Plus, we have a number of other organizations that are here that would love to have the time to talk with you. So if you want to go ahead, that'd be great. Sure. Um, well, first, thanks, thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. I just came from a class. I also do um, some wellness classes, the Arthritis Foundation um, exercise classes, and I do three of those a week, and that keeps me in touch with um, residents as well, what their needs are, sort of, and how they're feeling. But as the administrator of the assisted living, I've done that for quite a while now. I took a break. I started in 1999, and I came from a hospice background of about 12 years doing hospice nursing. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with Willamette Surgery to get them up and running, and I did that for about a year. And then an opening came at the Assisted Living at Dallas Retirement. I didn't know a lot about it, except that I knew that I was very interested in working with the older population. I had family that was getting older, and I myself just turned 65, so I'm, I can consider myself a geezer now. And um, <laughs> so I, I could really get in touch on many levels. So as the assisted living administrator at Dallas Retirement, it looks a little different than it does with the for-profit agencies that are out there. We, um, all I do basically is the assisted living administration and oversee the nursing. I don't do the human resources part of it or the volunteer part of it or the activities part of it or any of the financial things. All I do, I'm just responsible for the day-to-day -day running of filling rooms, making sure residents are being taken care of as they should. Uh, I do uh, meetings and a lot of staff training. But my time basically is with residents. I do all of the service plans so that I'm in touch, and I think that's a very important thing for the administrator to do. The nurses in assisted living work sort of on a consulting basis. And assisted living, I don't know how much you all know about it, but it's been around since the early 90s. And it has a uh, very, very popular in Oregon. We're one of the forerunners, as we were with the Pulse Forum for Physicians Order for Life Sustaining Treatment. We were kind of the forerunners with assisted living. So we sort of have a good handle on it. And it is the middle area that was designed for residents who were coming in that needed, that were safe behind closed doors but needed some assistance with their activities of daily living, maybe with their finances, uh, maybe putting on um, uh, TED hose or help with bathing, help with um, cutting up food at dinner times or reminders for, um, for eating, those types of things. And the nurses oversee the care from physicians orders. We do do medications for those residents who uh, choose that are not capable of being able to do it. And we do an assessment on just about everything because the state requires that. So it's, a, it's an interim living community where it's not independent, but we do, it is exactly what it says, assistance. We also have a memory care, which is a residential. Assisted living is considered community-based, so therefore it's not institutional as the nursing home is. The nursing home is considered more of a, an institution. Am I saying things that you guys have already said? Because no, stop me. Okay. Um, 
is considered more on the medical side or the institutional side, as opposed to the community-based side, which assisted living is, residential care is. Our memory care unit is also on the community-based side, which means we're not quite as heavily regulated as the nursing homes are, and our population is not quite as frail. However, since 1999, and we're now at 2013, I've seen quite a change in the population in the assisted living. We're getting people in the assisted living now that are what I consider to be nursing home light. Um, they are uh, n very much more needy than the, the initial population. And the reason for that is that it's very expensive. $4,000 a month, and that's just a base price for an assisted living. It's 6000 a month in the nursing home. So you can imagine that money doesn't go very far when you're thinking $4,000 and $6,000. So families are trying to come up with other ways to keep their mem family members home, their mom or their dad home. So that is one of the things that we're looking at right now, is how can we maybe reach out into the community and meet some of the needs in the community as well. Because assisted living going the way it's going at 4,000 bucks a month probably is going to need to look at doing things a lot differently. So um, as a career, I would say um, it's, it's challenging to do. It's uh, a little tough to get into. You do not need, uh, at the assisted living, I do have I have actually two bachelor's degrees, but you don't really need a bachelor's degree to do assisted living administrator. They're moving in that direction, but you do need to be certified and you do need to take a class to do it. Um, it's uh, every, every facility who has an assisted living has to have an administrator designated to that. In other words, the nursing home administrator, that's the health care administrator, cannot also do the assisted living. Um, let's see, what, what else can I tell you? What, what kinds of things do you want to know? You have questions? Yes? There, for us on the nonprofit side, there's a, the group that, that represents us is called Leading Age, and they have a certification program for um, anyone who wants to pay. I think it's $450 is what it costs to, to do it. And you do a, um, it's online, and then you do an in internship at a facility that's willing to take an intern for a few days so that you can sort of see how it goes on the um, not-for-profit side. And on the, uh, on the profit side, it's called Oregon Healthcare Association, and that is the group that will train um, on the for-profit side. Now, there's not a lot of different ex difference except that it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Not-for-profit means that we don't, any money that we make in our organization goes back into our organization. The for-profit people, um, because usually a lot of them are um, a chain, or I don't want to say a chain, they're, what's the word? There's, um, well, it is sort of a chain. There's several different organizations that are together, and they are self-contained. As I said, for us, I don't do HR work, human resources. I don't do any of the financial part of it. In a for-profit, if you were an administrator in a for-profit, you would handle all of that. That's part of what you would do. I'm going to actually pull it close because we've got, I want, you can talk with all of these folks individually. We have a number of sponsors here in addition to our panelists, so I want to make sure I give everybody time. Sure. Dallas Retirement Village is here, Shangri-La, Monmouth Senior Center, Timber Hill Athletic Club, Center 50 Plus, Northwest Senior and Disability Services, the Alzheimer's Network of Oregon, Willamette Valley Hospice, A Gift of Time, and the Grace Center are all here and they've been pa patiently sitting here so I want to encourage, let's give them all a round of applause and I want to encourage you to go to their tables.